get your coffee cake, get your coffee, get your water, get your tea, uh, come on in. Uh, we have a full and ambitious day uh, ahead of us. Um, welcome to our locals and welcome especially to our out of town guests. Welcome to Austin, Texas on this rather chill January morning. Uh, I'm Will Inboden, Executive Director of the Clement Center for National Security, a professor here at the uh, LBJ School of Public Affairs and one of your uh, several hosts or co-hosts for, hosts for, for, for today. Um, and uh, we started planning this conference about eight, nine months ago. It was really the brainchild of our dear friends from the Public Interest Declassification Board, of whom you'll hear more from uh, Ezra Cohen in, in a moment. Uh, but when they reached out suggesting something like this in partnership with the Clement Center and Strauss Center and LBJ School and Library, we thought this is a wonderful opportunity. And there are, you'll be hearing from a number of people today who have been laboring faithfully in the declassification vineyards, if you will, for years, even decades, right? So this is a, a long time cause for, for, for many of us. Uh, we did not plan when we started planning this nine months ago that treatment of classified documents would of a sudden become a topic of national interest. And I just say that in the most bipartisan of ways, and I think you, we can think of many bipartisan examples of this. But even more, just this morning in my morning news feed, I see the New York Times has a special feature on the overclassification problem. The Dispatch has a special feature just this morning on the overclassification problem. Fareed Zakaria's Washington Post column published just this morning on the overclassification problem. Peggy Noonan's Wall Street Journal column just went live this morning on the overclassification problem. I'm not making this up. You can't orchestrate this more, more perfectly, right? So uh, so the, the eyes of the universe are upon us here in, uh, in, in Austin, Texas, um, so let us not disappoint point. Uh, I will say um, that we have assembled uh, across academia, technology, uh, the U.S. government, the media, you know, to be blunt, kind of the murderer's row of experts on the on these issues. Uh, so we've got a real treat ahead of us here. But unfortunately, not everyone can make it. And as often goes with these things, just in the last two, three days, we've had uh, quite a bit of flux with uh, illnesses, a couple of speak speakers having to cancel, one speaker quite literally subpoenaed by the House Judiciary Committee to talk on this topic. I'm not making this up either. No, names to protect the innocent. And so did want to mention um, a number of other thought leaders who had hoped to be with us but can't today, Deborah Perlstein, Amy Ziegart, uh, Una, Una, Una Hathaway. But uh, we will honor them with their absence by devoting still tremendously good content for you, making interest. So uh, I'm now going to turn it over to my, my friend and uh, co-conspirator, unindicted co-conspirator, I should say, uh, Ezra Cohen with the PIDB. And he's going to tell you a little bit more about the PIDB's work and get us in our way. So Ezra, come on up. Thanks. Thanks. All right. Yeah. All right. All right. Uh, good morning, everyone, and, and um, you know, again, thanks to uh, uh, Will for uh, hosting us here, and thanks to the uh, staff of the LBJ Library, LBJ Foundation, and uh, Clement Center. And uh, first of all, I, I just, you know, w Will did this a little bit. He got the elephant uh, that was in the room kind of out of the way. Um, but, you know, it's true, nine months ago, uh, and I think it was a little over nine months ago when we sat down to talk about this conference, um, you know, I think we were a little worried we would just be speaking to ourselves, like, like we have been, and many of the people, the experts that you'll hear from today, I, I think that that's a concern. We've been speaking to ourselves for years. Um, unfortunately, reforms to the classification system have been viewed as kind of a you know, a, an easy deferred maintenance, you know, something that you can always put off. Um, and, and now it's really, uh, uh, the, the issue is in everybody's face. And so I think this is a tremendous opportunity uh, and, and, and we have, there is momentum. Um, now, now the key question is how do you seize that momentum? And hopefully today we'll, we'll talk about that. That's certainly something the board has been looking at since it was uh, created. Um, and I'll just, I'll, I'll just kind of, uh, conclude with this. I think, and, and one thing that's become extremely clear to me after two years of the, on the board uh, as chair, uh, this is really an issue that's about uh, a he the health of our society. Um, uh, Overclassification uh, creates a lot of problems throughout our society. Uh, it isn't just, you know, cost to the taxpayer. It's also uh, uh, this, this over-secrecy, this overdone secrecy, keeping the public in the dark, um, it, it, it means that, frankly, we, we have an uninformed electorate. Uh, it also means that we, um, that we 
open the opportunity to create uh, conspiracy theories. Uh, there are many, many examples of that, and we heard about that yesterday. And, and Carter asked a really good question yesterday. Um, he's not here yet, he's on his way. He asked a great question, he said, whose documents are these? Who do these documents belong to? Um, you know, they belong to the public. Um, and, uh, and so it's extremely important that the public, even if it's on a delayed timeline, right, maybe, maybe it's even 75 years from now, it's extremely important that ultimately the public be able to judge and uh, a, a judge and look at what the U.S. government has done. That, that's, that's extremely important. And it, frankly, it's a unique aspect of the uh, American system. I'd challenge you to find another country around the world that has that kind of assumption about transparency. Um, so as bad and maybe dysfunctional our system is, we still have a really good core uh, um, of value. And I think part of what I hope to get out of today and what the board hopes to get out of today is a uh, looking at ways to seize the current momentum, but also we need to explain to the American public why this isn't just an issue of finding a classified document in a place where it shouldn't be. Uh, there's a much deeper and, and important uh, societal issue here. So uh, with that, we're, we're gonna welcome up uh, our next panel. Um, I just wanna, on behalf of the board, uh, thank uh, everyone for being here today. Um, we were, you know, again, worried that we wouldn't even be able to fill things up, but uh, I understand the conference is oversubscribed. So um, I just want to thank everybody and uh, uh, thank you for joining us. All right, good morning, everybody. Good morning. I'm Aaron O'Connell. I'm the director of research here at the Clements Center for National Security and an associate professor in the history department. Uh, our first panel is entitled Scholars and Documents, a Complicated Relationship. And here's how we'll proceed. I'll introduce our panelists. They'll then give about five minutes of opening remarks on the role of declassification in scholarship. Uh, and then I'll give them a few questions. And then we'll open it up to the audience so that everybody can, uh, can participate and ask questions. Um, before I read the introduction, I just thought a thing that would be interesting to, 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 to weigh on. We are a combination of political scientists and historians up here. Uh, for the historians in the room, I know we have quite a number, maybe just put into your head what moments in history have been radically reinterpreted when a document was declassified, when new information came to light. Can you think of any? I have three or four in my mind, uh, but it's a, it's a great little test to understand the importance of declassification and scholarship when you can actually think of how history was changed when the secrets became public. Uh, but that'll, that'll be later. Let's, let's first begin uh, with introductions and our opening remarks. Our first speaker will be Dr. James Goldgeier. He's a visiting scholar at Stanford University's Center for International Security and Cooperation, a visiting fellow at the Brookings Institution, and a professor of international relations at the School of International Service at American University, where he also served as dean from 2011 to 2017. He's a senior advisor to the Bridging the Gap Initiative, funded by the Carnegie Corporation of New York and the Raymond Frankel Foundation, and he serves as the co-editor of the Oxford University Press Bridging the Gap book series. In addition to authoring or co-authoring four books, he is co-editor with Joshua Schifrinson of Evaluating NATO Enlargement from Cold War Victory to the Russian-Ukraine War to be published by Paul Grave Macmillan later this spring. Jim, the floor is yours for opening Great. remarks. Thanks, Aaron. Thanks. Oh, it's always such a thrill to be at, the, at UT Austin and uh, uh, at the invitation of the Clement Center. Um, so really appreciate the opportunity to be here. So I wanted to you know, follow up, as Aaron said, talking about the importance of declassification for scholarship. And I would argue also for current policy discussions. Um, and, uh, and I would just give a shout out to uh, Professor Inboden's uh, book, uh, The Peacemaker, uh, on Ronald Reagan, truly remarkable uh, accomplishment, uh, the book, and, and how important the insights are of Reagan's role and his, especially the relationship 
his efforts on diplomacy with the, with the Soviet Union, um, which I've been going back through uh, as I think about how we may uh, relate to Russia in the current context. But so I, I do want to say a few words about the US-NATO-Russia relationship at this moment in time and how important declassification has been, because there's a narrative out there. Um, it's especially promulgated by President Putin, that the US sought and still seeks to keep Russia down. Um, well, the US has certainly sought to prevent Russia from taking territory that doesn't belong to it. Um, but I think the historical record is pretty clear that in the post-Cold War period, uh, the United States really did a lot to try to reach out to Russia and uh, assist Russia in its post-communist transition uh, and bring Russia closer to the West. And there's certainly a lot of debate, and should be a lot of debate, about what happened and why, but we can't really have that debate properly without an understanding of the historical record. Back in 2018, I was Googling, I don't even remember what I was Googling for, but I was Googling something, and up popped uh, the Clinton Presidential Library site. And I realized that the library had declassified uh, the Clinton-Yeltsin record, the uh, about 56, I think, phone calls, uh, memorandum of conversation from their telephone conversations, uh, and another um, 18 uh, in-person meetings that they had had. And uh, they had declassified the uh, records of those meetings. Uh, I learned later in response to requests from uh, the National Security Archives, Svetlana Savranskaya, and historian Mary, Mary Sorati. Um, and what was really, first of all, what was truly amazing about this, I mean, hundreds of pages of documents, uh, there was one sentence redacted, um, which is pretty unusual and I think is a demonstration of how most of the things <laughs> that get redacted don't need to be redacted. Um, and in fact, there were things in there when I was reading, I was like, I can't believe that wasn't redacted. <laughs> um, but then I realized, yeah, it didn't really, you know, it, it didn't really need to be. Uh, and I was pleased then to be able to write up a piece on the, on the documents for the Texas National Security Review. I'm trying to give as many plugs as possible here to, to this You're place. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm working it. Um, welcome back here. <laughs> yeah, thanks. <laughs> so I had earlier written a book with Mike McFall on U.S.-Russia relations in the aftermath of the Cold War. We covered the period from about 1991 to 2002. And so I knew a lot about the the relationship based on interviews, but reading the documents gave me appreciation, a greater appreciation for three key issues. One was just how important it was for Yeltsin to be treated as an equal. And I would argue that this has been an enormous motivation for the Soviet Union and then Russia uh, since the Khrushchev period. Uh, there was a brief window in the 1970s when, you know, the two countries, the US and the USSR, were seen as equal superpowers. But certainly, uh, this has not been the case since the late 1980s. Clinton went out of his way over and over again to try to say to Yeltsin, I'm treating you as an equal. I'm treating, you know, he, he really, and he did certain things. He would remind Yeltsin, you know, we changed the G7 to a G8, things like that. Um, uh, but um, it required sort of constant reassurance. And I would argue this has been a big uh, issue. Um, for example, President Obama's comment that Russia is just a regional power, uh, those kinds of things uh, definitely great uh, on the Russian uh, leadership. Um, <coughs> reading the record also clarified for me in a way that I hadn't, um, in a way that I hadn't really um, thought as much about prior to reading the record, just how much they accomplished in their first term, how much less they accomplished in their second terms. Um, and how much of what they accomplished was really about resolving legacy issues from the Soviet period, as opposed to charting new cooperation going forward. Things like the disposition of strategic nuclear weapons, Soviet Union broke apart, there were four countries with strategic nuclear warheads on their territory, Belarus, Ukraine, Kazakhstan, Russia, uh, and the United States and Russia worked together uh, so that only Russia uh, would come out of that as a nuclear power. Certainly um, a bit of a controversy today, for sure. Uh, getting, making sure the Red Army uh, troops were removed from the Baltics, those kind of post-Soviet legacy issues. But going for things going forward, um, really not as much in terms of lasting cooperation. Uh, which brings me to NATO enlargement, a uh, hugely debated topic. Uh, 
That's why we have an edited volume. Josh Schifferson and I have very different views on NATO enlargement have this volume coming out this spring. Uh, in my view, the United States rightly pursued this policy, and Josh isn't here to argue the opposite. Um, <laughs> and Clinton worked hard to keep this issue from, having, from harming the relationship. Russia did join the Partnership for Peace. It joined the implementation force in Bosnia after the Dayton Accords were signed. Uh, and uh, Russia signed the NATO-Russia Founding Act. Um, what you see from the documents is just how much, Yeltsin obviously made his displeasure known about NATO enlargement, but the conversation wasn't nearly as dramatic as the conversation over the Kosovo War, where Yeltsin was really furious uh, about the NATO-led war uh, against Serbia. And I think, you know, what, what, has, what I've come to appreciate um, since reading those and then thinking more about it is that what people miss when they complain about how much damage NATO enlargement did to the U.S.-Russia relationship is that the first two rounds, the, you know, 10 countries coming in, occurred in the shadow of much bigger concerns to the Russian government. The first three members, Poland, Hungary, Czech Republic, came in in March of 99 as NATO was launching this war. The war against Kosovo was a much bigger deal for the Russians. And the second round, the so-called Big Bang, including the Baltic countries in 2004, was occurring during the color revolutions. Uh, and you know those color revolutions were a much bigger deal to Putin uh, than NATO enlargement was, because he saw it as a direct threat to um, his, own, uh, his own rule. You know, these are, these are live issues. Uh, they've had a big impact on how people view the war. Uh, they've had a big impact on Putin's propaganda efforts and whether they're successful or not. Um, and understanding the historical context, which is assisted by our access to understanding the historical record, is thus key to our historical understanding and our scholarship, but it feeds into current policy discussions in important ways. So, thank you. Thank you, Jim. Okay, our second speaker today is Sheena Chestnut Greitens. She's an associate professor at the LBJ School of Public Affairs here at UT, where she directs UT's Asia Policy Program, a joint initiative of the Clement Center for National Security and the Strauss Center for International Security and Law. She is also a Jean Kirkpatrick Visiting Fellow at AEI and an associate in research at the Fairbanks Center for Chinese Studies at Harvard University. Dr. Greitens research focuses on American national security, East Asia, and authoritarian politics and foreign policy. Her first book, Dictators and Their Secret Police, good title, Coercive Institutions and State Violence, came out from Cambridge in 2016 and received multiple academic awards. She's got two other book manuscripts in progress, uh, one from uh, on, on authoritarianism and diaspora politics in North Korea, and uh, the other on internal security and Chinese grand strategy. Sheena, you've got five minutes. Terrific. Explain <laughs> the world. I will say this is the first time I think I've been named as part of a murderer's row, so um, I'm not sure how to process that. I'm going to have to think about that later. Um, second one caveat, I am the representative political scientist on this panel, which means that largely that I practice history without a license. So, um, so take those, filter my, my comments today accordingly. OK, all right. Um, I thought you were more of a historian, Jim. I appreciate um, that. So, you know, a lot of the conversation today will talk mostly about the utility of declassification for understanding American democracy and American foreign policy itself. And uh, I will second the remarks of the, the panelists and, and the, um, the welcoming remarks so far in saying that I do believe that declassification of records is, un is essential for understanding the workings of American democracy and of our own foreign policy. But what I wanted to focus on today, since I think um, uh, we'll have plenty of time to talk about that, is also the contribution that American declassific declassification can make to the history of other parts of the world and really to a shared global history. And I saw that really firsthand in, in the book um, that, that you very kindly mentioned, um, which is a book about Cold War history in Taiwan, South Korea, and the Philippines. And so I spent a lot of time at the National Archives and a couple of different presidential libraries um, looking at the Cold War domestic politics of those three countries. But the records were uneven. 
those countries were not democracies, and the declassification and records retention um, policies in, for example, the Philippines are still very much being debated. There is There are documents that remain with the armed forces of the Philippines that have not yet been transferred to any archive or library for processing, and uh, even though they've formally been uh, sort of turned over legally, there is no physical custody transfer, and so those records remain un inaccessible to the, the public um, for, for scholarship. And so in the absence of some of those records, um, and, and it's also been clear that, that, that at least some of the records have been destroyed just by the climate and where they were stored, um, and maybe for other reasons um, as well over the course of, of decades. Um, and so what that means is that some of the best insights we have, not only on the US alliance with each of those countries, but actually reporting on domestic developments and the history, the political history of those countries comes from the conversations and the observations of American diplomats and American personnel in, who were on the ground in those countries and talking with counterparts and with members of, of society about those developments. Um, and so for example, um, you know, I read really extensively through the conversations that the United States had with Chiang Kai-shek and other members of the ROC government in the late 1940s after Chiang Kai-shek and a, a small group of, of his supporters had moved to the island of Taiwan. And the United States really had very difficult conversations with him in this period about the need to get not only sort of foreign policy uh, and what we would consider his, you know, his relationship with the United States reoriented, but also really the need to much better manage um, the governance of Taiwan itself um, as the last remaining sort of territory that the, the KMT controlled. Um, and that had massive effects on how Chiang Kai-shek governed, sub -sub subsequently governed Taiwan. And the book looks really at some of the effects of that shift in policy that, uh, that Chiang and the KMT pursued over the course of the 1950s. Um, so the reason that I, I use that example and that I, I stress that, I could go through a similar examples from South Korea and from the Philippines as well over the course of the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, and the 80s until those countries became uh, uh, democracies. Um, but just to emphasize that the United States, because it has now for so many decades had a truly global reach and impact on the world, um, not only has insights in declassified materials that are important for understanding our role in the world, but that are also just important in understanding developments across many regions of the world and the way that those developments interact with each other to form and constitute a global history. Um, and I think it's really important to just understand that, there's, um, that, that there are both of those dimensions and that declassification contributes to both of those things. It, it is fundamentally a question and a responsibility for us as American citizens and American scholars and policymakers, um, but there is also a contribution that we are choosing to make um, toward the understanding that people can have literally around the world of their own history um, and, and of the history of the relationships between countries and, and actors in a global environment. Um, the only thing I wanted to add briefly, if I have a minute to do so, is to, to put one small asterisk that also emerged very clearly from the historical work that I did. Um, and to say that there's a, a narrow scope condition where I would continue to exert a lot of caution on the declassification process. And I mention this because in some ways I think setting those narrow scope conditions actually helps us be more permissive about declassification in other cases. Um, and that is that in a lot of the cables I read, there were foreign sources named over and over again who were providing important information and insights to the United States and therefore to this historical record. Um, and in non-democracies, the stakes of sharing or passing on that information can be very high, often deadly. Um, and so I think about today, um, how we manage a declassification process, and I know this is, this is essential and fundamental, and uh, Director Haynes talked about this last night, um, but how we uh, you know, implement that process of transparency and that principle of transparency in a way that respects the safety and frankly the principled uh, courage of the people who are sometimes um, sharing that, that information. Again, I identify that as a narrow scope condition because I think it makes it easier then to talk about the importance of declassifying things more, more broadly and of then creating that, that shared global history that I think the United States can offer both to ourselves and, and to the rest of the world. Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. <coughs> Appreciate it.
finally, our, our third speaker is Dr. Jeremy Surrey. He is the Mac Brown Distinguished Chair for Leadership and Global Affairs at the University of Texas at Austin and Professor of History in the College of Liberal Arts and in the LBJ School. He is the author and editor of 11 books on contemporary politics and foreign policy, so many that they don't fit on one page. Uh, most recently, <laughs> Civil War by Other Means, America's Long and Unfinished Fight for Democracy, earlier ones in sort of a rude two to three year chunks that make all other scholars feel a little bit concerned. He's published uh, The Impossible Presidency, The Rise and Fall of America's Highest Office, Liberty's Surest Guardian, American Nation Building from the Founders to Obama, Henry Kissinger in the American Century, and the list goes on. Uh, Jeremy, you've got five minutes. Great, thank you, Aaron. Uh, thank you, uh, Will, and uh, thank you, Mark Lawrence and others for organizing this event. It's really uh, a pleasure to be here. A great job last night, Adam, by the way. A uh, really uh, <coughs> wonderful way to start us out. So as Aaron said, I'm a historian, and the first thing any historian has to say, particularly a diplomatic historian, is that uh, the work we do wouldn't be possible if it weren't for the declassification of documents, right? That's, this is the lifeblood uh, of what we do and the work that the Foreign Relations Series and the State Department Office does is so crucial. Uh, but I don't think of documents in the way I used to, and I don't think of declassification in the way I used to. As a grad student, we were always you know, trying to find that smoking gun document that would allow us to show that all the people who had written books on the subject were wrong. <laughs> and uh, such a document doesn't exist in most cases. There are some rare cases. Aaron will have a few. Um, the reason declassification matters is because we want to be able to read a large stream of documents. We want to understand the broader climate of thinking. We want to understand the broader relationships as they develop. So releasing one document here and one document there as many societies do, and as sometimes we do around certain issues, doesn't help as much as having that larger stream of documents. And I think that's, that's really what, what we care about. I think there are three ways we can think about this, three, why, three ways why, or three reasons why more full um, declassification, more of a, a, a culture of declassification will be crucially important for us. Uh, first, uh, it's the only way we can understand why decision makers do what they do. They always tell us why they think they're doing what they do, but that's not always why they do what they do. It's not conspiratorial, right? We're driven by many motivations. The mystery of history is what is it in a particular set of circumstances that drives us to think a certain way. And uh, when we have a larger stream of documents, a larger archive of documents with more perspectives, we're able to reconstruct the thinking of decision makers. There's no other way to do that. That's what's so hard for us in the policy space, to reconstruct the thinking of Vladimir Putin. But at the very least, we need to be able to reconstruct the thinking of our own policymakers. And it's only through the fuller declassification that we can do that. It's very hard when you only have a small collection of documents or a collection of documents around a particular set of issues. Uh, what a larger stream of documents give us is they give us a sense of how ideas have developed and been put into practice. And so I think a great example of this, we're in the LBJ uh, Presidential Library, um, our knowledge, our understanding of Lyndon Johnson's complex motivations as a Southern Democrat, but yet an advocate of civil rights, as a cold warrior, but yet someone who had his doubts about Vietnam from the start, uh, as someone who was a confident political actor, but also living in the shadow of the Kennedy family. All of these complex issues that so many in this room have written about uh, these issue, issues you can only really understand when you have a fuller sense of the documentation around decision making. And so that's one of the main reasons why we need a fuller documentary record. And we're nowhere near where we should be, in fact, if we want to reconstruct these issues. There's a second reason, which is that when we're trying to understand a foreign society that we've had long-term relations with, often the best source we have are our own so sources. So if you want to understand the development of Iranian policy in the last three, four, five decades, you're not going to be able to go to the Iranian archive, everyone realizes. It's actually our record, our long, deep, extensive record of relations with Iran that is actually one of the best global sources for understanding Iranian policy. And so a fuller declassification, particularly of high level and often sensitive interactions between our society and another society is absolutely crucial if we're ultimately going to be able to understand how that society's thinking about the world has evolved. And I would say this, and, and, and Sheena might, might correct me, 
but I think so much of what we understand about Chinese foreign policy, so much of what we understand about the ways in which China has developed as a society, as an entity, actually comes from our reading of American documents, American interactions uh, with Chinese interlocutors of one size or one kind or another. Now, this is not an argument for only relying on American documents. But it is an argument for the ultimate value, the global value that actually American documents provide in understanding the larger policy space that we operate in. And then the third point, right, we have the importance of the documents to understanding the development of our policy. We have the importance of the documents to understanding the development of other societies' policies. The third point I'd make that I think is often forgotten in these discussions is that declassification is crucial not simply for holding particular leaders accountable, but for informing the American public about how our policy is made. And counteracting, I think, a tendency that has long existed, a tendency that goes back to the 19th century, which is to weaponize secrecy at home as well as abroad. And uh, I'm going to cross into political territory here. I think there's been too much of that in the last few years. The use of um, selective release of documentation, selective leaking of information through Congress, through elsewhere, through the White House at times, the selective leaking of information, which is not a new story, but a story that has been done quite frequently or followed quite frequently in a way to try to distort current debates, to distort the way we understand how one actor or another actor has interacted with a foreign entity of one kind or another. Uh, full declassification provides our press and our citizen body with a way to actually make fairer judgments, and it disempowers those who would try to use selective secrecy to actively distort the political environment. Uh, and I think it's the paradox of our moment that we have so much information, but so much selective use of secret information. And the best way I know of to counteract that would be to create more of a culture of openness and make it harder for individual actors, even empowered actors, to weaponize the materials um, that they have. Uh, I, I want to close on, on these three points about the breadth of documentation, getting beyond individual documents, having a broader stream of documents for understanding American thinking, foreign thinking, and our democracy. To just bring up a, a, a final point on this, and it, it's something that um, I'm saying in part because Adam is here from the historian's office, but it's, it's really important. The Foreign Relations Series of the United States, which uh, is a really monumental collection of documents uh, published by our government on American foreign policy, I am always struck by how often it is used by scholars, citizens, journalists all over the world. And to think about uh, the value that provides, not just in terms of historical information, but American public diplomacy and America's image. And to think about how we could use that as more of a model for the way we think about uh, documentation in other agencies and other parts of our government. I often ask myself, why don't we have a foreign relations series uh, for the intelligence agencies? I kind of know the answer. But why don't, we have, why don't we have a foreign relations series for the Defense Department, uh, for so many other parts, uh, parts of our government? I do think that the openness of information is generally to our credit as a society. And the closure of information is often, even though we do have to, as you said, Sheena, we have to protect certain sources. Uh, the historian in me says the closure of information usually benefits our enemies more than it benefits ourselves. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Suri. Okay, I'm going to take the chair's prerogative to ask two questions, and then we'll open up to the audience for everyone to discuss. Um, and I'll just ask the panels, and feel free to weigh in uh, on either of the two at any time. So the first is, uh, basically the job of scholars is to make relevant distinctions. So let's see if we can make some relevant distinctions about this crucial issue of documents, scholarship, and the need for secrecy. So do you have a personal scorecard? How do you think we are doing managing the needs for state secrets in certain cases with the need for openness in, a, in civil society. Dr. Greitens gave us a, a, a nice early scope condition. Let's not reveal the names of overseas spies. That's a pretty good one. Are there others you might think, like this obviously should not, even if it would be good for the public to learn about, this obviously has to be protected. So that's the first question. Personal scorecard on the balance, these two important uh, imperatives. And the second is just to return to my first one, any smoking guns? Do any scholars up here or in the audience know of a moment where a document declassified changed an interpretation, caused whole books to be obsolete because the new information really definitively some, settled some kind of historical or policy issue? So uh, take either one you like. If, if it's okay, can I go down the line? Uh, Jim, do you wanna start or? 
Well, sure, I'm happy to start. I, I, you know, on the first one, um, I, I mean, I, you know, we heard last night from Director Haynes. I mean, I, she says there's way too much uh, overclassification uh, and uh, that that's harming, uh, it's harming democracy because it's important for citizens to be able to know what's going on and to be able to hold their government accountable. So, um, uh, you know, I was really pleased to hear that and also pleased to hear her call for more resources for declassification, uh, which is critical uh, to actually uh, getting um, things declassified uh, that may be overclassified uh, in the first instance. Um, you know, it's interesting. I, I mentioned that when I went through the uh, Clinton Presidential Library documents, uh, there were moments when I was really surprised that there were things that hadn't been redacted. So I'll give you one example and then why, you know, then when I thought about it, I thought, yeah, it, this didn't need to be redacted. So um, one of the big issues between Clinton and Yeltsin was the issue of Russian support for the Iran uh, nuclear reactor at Bushir and in general, what Russian firms were doing to support Iran in the nuclear space that might then create a problem for <coughs> Um, Iranian, uh, create, you know, support for a, an Iranian nuclear weapons program. And um, Yelt, one of the features of these, of these uh, presidential documents, by the way, that's really important is that as you see, because you see the, the conversations unfold over time, it's just how important it was for each leader to, you know, make asks of the other, for the other to respond, and then in follow-up meetings to, for the, for each to say, remember I said I would do this and I did that and, you know, uh, as a way of building trust. And one of the things that Clinton was pushing was for Yeltsin to rein in what was going on, the transfers from Russia to Iran. Um, and so Clinton raised it at one of these meetings and Yeltsin said, you know, you, you've raised this before. I, I, I'm, I've done something about this. This isn't happening. And Clinton said, well, in fact, uh, we have evidence that there are Russian firms um, continuing to support Iran in ways that you might not be aware of, and I'm going to hand you uh, this piece of paper that will um, explain uh, our understanding of this, um, that information that might be helpful to you. And I was like, you know, especially because it was about a nuclear program. I was like, gosh, I'm really surprised to see this. But of course, it, I mean, it was about a nuclear program, but the, the conversation did not reveal sources and methods, right? There was nothing about the conversation that revealed anything that couldn't be shared. Um, you know, it was interesting that the United States felt it needed to help Yeltsin understand what was going on, whether he was you know, willfully not understanding it or whether he really didn't have the capacity to know what certain parts of, uh, you know, the Russian government uh, in conjunction with other Russian ent entities might be doing. Um, you know, we don't know. But, that, but, but I, I think that's the, you know, I think that sort of gets to this, right? It's about sources and methods. It's about, you know, helping, uh, you know, in providing information that would enable uh, people to, uh, you know, build nuclear weapons more easily, those kinds of things. You expect those things to remain, um, to remain out of the public view. But other things should, you know, we should be able to discuss them and to understand, understand them. And I think in that case, it gave us a greater understanding of both the challenges on the Russian side, the way in which the United States was pursuing something that was important to it and, you know, Providing information to the to the Russian government. I mean, you know, you could argue. It, it, I mean, that exchange is embarrassing to Yeltsin, um, but you know, there's no reason why we shouldn't know about it. Great, thank you, Dr. Dragons. Yeah, let me take your your second question first, and I can think of at least three instances from the field that I'm I'm working on right now, which is Chinese history and politics, where. Um, access to information that was previously concealed has really changed our understanding of political developments inside China and China's relationships with the outside world. Um, the first is The Great Leap Forward, and there's a great book called Tombstone 
that I would commend to anybody who's interested in uh, the tragedy that is the Great Leap Forward that was done by a Chinese scholar whose father died um, in, uh, in the famine, in the Great Leap Forward. And he spent a lot of his career going around to different provincial and local archives and piecing together accounts of the impact of the famine um, and tells a much more complete um, and really compelling story about the costs of that policy and about decision making at various levels of the, the Chinese political system. Um, and without his work, which was courageous and for which he's paid a political price, um, he writes that the, the book is a tombstone um, to his father, to all those who died, and potentially to himself uh, or for himself. Um, uh, it hasn't gone that far yet, but it, uh, it's pretty clear that, that this was a risky and a, a costly decision for him to, to publish this book. It's only been published in, in Hong Kong and then in English language editions. Um, but I think we have a very different understanding and more, much more complete understanding of that tragedy as a result of the, the work that, that he's done. Um, the second is Tiananmen in 1989, um, where the opening of archives, the Chinese archives are, are still by and large uh, pretty restricted. That's become even more so over the course of the past decade. Um, and in fact, the only time I have ever been interviewed by the Chinese security services about, or the government about what exactly I was doing uh, in a particular place at a particular time was um, asking to read uh, copies of the local paper at a municipal archive in Northern China. Um, so archival research is um, often difficult, has become more difficult over the course of the, the past decade um, as the party has really tried to sort of exert ownership over a particular narrative of party history. Um, so we've been forced to rely on, for example, mirror documentation from other communist states um, whose archives have now been opened um, and understand their conversations with, um, with Chinese leaders and Chinese diplomats. And again, I think that's changed our understanding of how much global politics drove China's response to events in, in Tiananmen, um, not just sort of domestic concern about either elite or, or popular protest. Um, and the third one is the Sino-Soviet split, where I think the United States had a very different um, understanding and, and really kind of missed the fundamental and complete rupture that occurred um, around 1960, um, at least for a couple of years. And had that information been um, more available earlier, it might have actually changed American foreign policy during that period of the Cold War in ways that, that are complex and very hard to predict. Um, but we simply can't rerun the tapes of history and find out. Um, but those are three events that I can think of that our understanding has really shifted as the result of this sort of accumulation of, of good historical work. In terms of how, um, <clears throat> how we're doing, I, I mean, I think um, there's a, a lot of work to do. Um, I do think that it's important to acknowledge that email has made this problem sort of exponentially more challenging. And I know we have a panel talking about technology uh, coming up later this morning. But I will say, just to give you one small example of, of what this looks like, um, you know, we are a public university. Um, and I received a, a Freedom of Information Act equivalent request um, for all of the emails that I had sent at one point since I got, since a certain period um, while I was at UT, sent or received. Um, I actually had no idea how many that was, but I had to go do a count right. because we had to estimate how long it would take someone to go through and review all of these for student privacy and other, other reasons. I mean, it turned out it was about 7,000 emails huh. in a 15 month period. Um, so, and I'm not a particularly high volume emailer. Uh, I do anything I can to avoid send, spending time on, on email. So, um, so if you think about that in much larger government bureaucracies with much more important issues um, in terms of the sensitivity of sources or the topics being covered, um, and you think about someone who's worked in government for a decade um, and just one person, um, what going through their, their records looks like. I think you begin to get a sense of the, the scope and just the difficulty of separating the kind of the wheat from the chaff and the things that need to be reviewed closely and the things that are like, can you meet at two o'clock today? Um, yeah. Which should be pro forma, but we don't, you know, we don't have as good a way to, to, to go through those kinds of records. And, and um, so I want to acknowledge both just the, the challenge that the that the intelligence community is is grappling with, especially in the sort of post email era. Um, but also as a result of that, I think it's very clear that we are not keeping up 
um, and there are things that are well past the 30-year declassification um, timeline that is sort of a hypothetical benchmark for when we should be, um, have, be able to review things that clearly are not accessible um, and that, we're, that would shed light on policy. Um, one of the things I learned from looking at the record of Chinese history um, that I think is important for policy to pick up on, on Jim's point a moment ago is that it gives you a certain humility about um, decision making. And that's not to let policymakers off the hook, right? Um, it's why we need to see what, they're, what they are seeing. Um, but it also sometimes like, wow, what we saw from the outside really wasn't quite right on this particular closed society. And I think that's an important lesson for, for policy on as we think about how to grapple with the uncertainty of some of the challenges that, that we deal with. Um, but just as an overall scorecard, you know, no, we're not where we need to be. We need to push for more toward the transparency and declassification side. Absolutely, I think that's, a, that's very clear as a sort of bottom line verdict. Something below a gentleman's C on the report card. Ooh. <laughs> I was trying not to quantify it. Fair enough, fair enough. <laughs> Dr. Suri. So um, when I think of smoking guns, I mean, there are the cases, Aaron and I were talking about this before, the Venona. Uh, documents which, of course, did change the way we see Alger Hiss, or the way some people see people, uh, uh, figures like Alger Hiss and others. But really, when I think about smoking guns, I think about a range of documents and a range of material that, when looked at closely, has fundamentally changed the conventional wisdom. So I'll give two examples of many. Uh, the book I just finished on the legacies of the Civil War, I spent a lot of time on Ulysses Grant. His papers are all published. They've been published, I think it's 73 volumes of his letters. Uh, but what you realize, and it's not unique to me, but what a group of historians the last four or five years have realized, reading those letters closely in light of the world we're in, is that the image almost everyone has in this room of Grant from high school history is entirely wrong. That he wasn't a drunk. Uh, he wasn't someone who uh, in the White House was dominated by corruption, but actually cared very deeply about civil rights. Uh, it still doesn't change his failures as a president, but it changes the ways you think about the presidency, the modern presidency evolving, because here you have a president who wants to do the right things. I think it's pretty clear he does. He spent hours every day reading letters written by Southerners, Southern uh, Republicans and Southern freedmen and women describing the horrors of their condition, describing the racism in the South, um, and how little power he had within his own party to act upon that. It actually makes you, um, it makes you appreciate someone like Lyndon Johnson in a different kind of way when you see how difficult these issues are. Uh, that is not the way the story was told based on the non-private documentation. Um, so that's one example of how reading documents fundamentally change the way we see a historical figure and we see something like the presidency, an office like the presidency in our own time. I'll give it a contrary example. Uh, when I was writing my book on Henry Kissinger, uh, Kissinger himself and most scholars of Kissinger, whether they liked him or didn't like him, the argument was that American foreign policy for Nixon and Kissinger was driven by their own ideas of foreign policy and the international system that they were in and that domestic politics didn't matter. And if you have Henry Kissinger in any setting, even at 99, he'll make sure to tell you that in the first few minutes. And most people believe that, right? He's the grand realist. Uh, you get into the documents and you immediately realize that's actually not true. That the volume of discussion of domestic politics is extraordinary. Just one example. Uh, during the 73 war, during the Yom Kippur War, the discussion over raising the American nuclear alert. If I'll go back and read the minutes of that, it's not just a discussion of what's happening in the Middle East, it's a discussion at home. And a discussion in particular about whether Haig and, and uh, Kissinger should do that when Nixon's not in the room, which they do. Uh, so understanding the domestic politics that are driving them, understanding the role of the National Security Establishment, the role of the National Security Council, the role or the non-presence of the president in the decision to raise the DEF CON, uh, all of that is only understandable when you get into the material. It totally changes the view you have of how nuclear weapons are handled, how we handle a DEF CON, and the role of domestic politics in these decisions during a crisis. Uh, now, it's of course more complex than simply saying domestic politics drives everything, but it fundamentally changes the way we think about these issues. So I, I think that's absolutely crucial. Now, on grading us, uh, for the sake of being provocative, but I also actually believe this, I, I give us a, a hard F in the way, we've, the way we've done our work. And I'll say why. Um, 
in, in my experience, and of course there's a lot I haven't seen, but in my experience, most of the secrets that are held from the American public are partially or largely known by the people we're trying to hold them from overseas and not known by the American public. And there's a reverse ordering um, to this, right? Uh, the Manhattan Project is only one of many, <laughs> many examples of this. But time and again, I'm struck in the archive by how much our adversaries know, how much they pick up, and how little the public knows. One example of this, one of many examples that I wrote about years ago. Uh, in 1969, Nixon and Kissinger decide that in order to put pressure on the Soviets, they're going to undertake a number of maneuvers to try to pressure the Soviets to think that the United States might be considering some kind of nuclear action. This is Kissinger's madman theory, to try to get the Soviets to help get us out of Vietnam. Uh, if you look carefully at East German documents, which actually recount what's going on in the Soviet Union, the Soviets know exactly what's going on. The American public knows none of it. And in fact, it's misconstrued uh, in the press. This is one of many cases, right, where secrecy empowers the adversary rather than empowering us. And back to my point from before, I worry often that we are using secrecy to empower one political actor or another in our country rather than national security, and national security is being used as an excuse. Um, and and I, I wish that the DNI had talked more about that last night. Again, I'm not a cynic. I'm not arguing that this is what's driving most of classification, but I am arguing that this is a necessary symptom of an overclassification process that allows that behavior. And until we change that, you know, for me, we're in the F space. Great. Maybe I'm a tough grader. I don't know. Thanks. Thank you. All right, we're going to move to audience questions. Jim has one retort you, you wanted to make. Is that yeah, so? Yeah, I just wanted. Okay. I just had one thing I wanted to say, and I think it sort of follows up from things Jeremy's been talking about and Sheena too. Um, the, this, on the smoking gun issue, because I think, I mean, that's an important, it's an important question, but I think what going through major document collections give you is, is big picture understandings. And I think that's more important than, a, you know, any particular document, any particular sort of, sort of smoking gun. Just to give you an example, I once went through for a book I was working on, um, Clinton's national security advisor, Anthony Lake, his declassified papers, his classified papers, which didn't have access to, but his, his declassified papers are housed at the Library of Congress. And I went through the collection and all these small little note cards, you know, with this very difficult to read handwriting. Um, you know, don't feel sorry for me, but it was kind of a challenge to go through. <laughs> but what really, but, but what it gave me was the, the he was spending almost all of his time on Haiti, Bosnia, Somalia. Those were three big crises of the first Clinton term. And as I read through and I kept going through Haiti, Bosnia, Somalia, I was like, where the heck are Russia and China? Like, these are the big things he should be dealing with. But of course, it was these crises and the importance of, the, of them politically that led him to spend you know, note card after note card uh, on those three issues. And I think sort of being able to get that kind of, of big picture understanding and then thinking about what the implications are um, when you're thinking about what's really important long term for the United States and its foreign policy, uh, you know, comes from being able to go through a collection like that. Thank you so much, Jim. Okay, folks, we're moving to audience questions. I'm looking at our organizers here. We want them coming to the central mics, I assume. So if you have a question, please come up. Please identify yourself as we're recording this. And let me just remind our wonderful audience that questions end in question marks. They do not end in ellipses. They do not end in commas or even exclamation points. So can we have questions from the audience, please? Thank you so much. If you'd like to ask a question, please step up to the microphone and identify yourself. Uh, good morning, uh, Alex Howard. Um, here from DC, but this will not be a question as a comment or vice versa. Um, one of the things that uh, you can now do at FOIA.gov is see what the oldest requests are. And there's supposed to be a 25-year sunset that was put in in 2016. That's not working quite yet. Um, one of the things you can also see is presidential libraries go back to FDR. But before that, not so much. So this is the scholar panel. Um, you mentioned a 75-year window. At what point should we expect the U.S. government to be fully open and transparent 
about what was happening in the 18th century or the 19th century or the 20th century, since we're now amazingly 23 years into this new one. Um, like, where does that balance get set? Um, can you go back and get historical materials that tell us, you mentioned Grant, right, but his predecessors, or what was happening in Reconstruction, which seems to me to be a really important part of our history to understand right now. I agree. Can you go back <laughs> and get that information and get that? Because my sense is that that is not the case, and there's still quite a bit that's classified from those centuries that would inform what's happening today. And if so, what should we be doing about that? I mean, as, as scholars, you think about how history informs the present. Thank you for that. Do we have oldest documents not declassified? Is that something that we should be tracking as a nation? Yeah. And if so, do we need a commission? Do we need an extra body? Does the PIDB need a lot of money? Is this a DARPA issue? Like, what, what should we do about mm -hmm. getting the historical record from a long time ago? Because I know I'd like to see those things. And there doesn't seem to be a lot of national security issues from understanding what Lincoln was really thinking, uh, as well as Mr. Spielberg tried to dramatize that. So thank you. Thank you for your question. So I'll, I'll just say I, I agree 100 percent. There are a lot of documents, really not too many from the 19th century, but there are a lot of documents from, example, World War I, World War II era that still remain classified, things I'm sure I don't know about, the others in the audience know more, know more about. Uh, but I think the problem is fundamentally that the presumption is against declassification. We need a system where there's an automatic, really, I know it's in the legislation, but really where there's an automatic declassification that occurs unless there's a reason to classify, to keep something classified. Um, and uh, before it was said that you know we're the only society that's open about its documents in this way, well, we are in remarkably open. We deserve praise. But Germany and Britain, uh, I would say, have a much better system and are more open, I'm sorry to say. Uh, because there's a presumption. You go to the Bundesarchiv and anything is 25 years or older and the presumption is that it's open. Uh, that there's actually a burden on the German government to keep something closed. So I would like to turn the burden around, which I think would make a big difference. I understand why that's hard to do with agencies, but I think that's what we need to do. It's a, it's a fabulous question. I, I, I think to, I, I'd like to know. I don't know. Are there any, you know, modern classification is a 20th century invention. Are there any documents that the U.S. government is not releasing from the 19th century, where the government, not a particular archive or someone's private collection? I, I don't know the answer. My guess is no, but I could be I wrong. Think from the Philippines. I mean, others will know, but my understanding is that this is yeah. a great question for scholars. Yeah. Other questions? Yes, sir. Please come on up. I'm Carl Fisher from the University of Texas. Um, following up a little bit on the issues that are brought up about context, context and scale. Um, I've heard that, for instance, the Obama administration has on the order of two billion emails in their, in their White House. And so let's assume that technology, we can snap our fingers and we can do technology and we can declassify all this information. So I guess the question from a historical context is how do we preserve that information and what the technology issues are associated with that, both within the United States and globally? And then from a historical perspective, how do historians query that information? Because you're not going to go and get the triple carbon document that's stored somewhere, and you're going to have to interact with that data. And so what's the technology, whether it's the government maintains it or the commercial sector, that allows historians to work with that huge volume of data in a way that doesn't introduce further biases and issues that also create a transparency problem? Yeah, not just a transparency problem, but an interpretation problem. So the, the easy technology one I think of is keyword searching, which once you have OCR readable documents, you can build massive mountains of evidence for your specific and narrow claim because you keyword search for torture Cuba and you've got 60 documents and you can say there's an enormous record showing this occurred, 10 times more information than we ever had before. Well, what about the other ways of keyword searching, right? So the, the way you search will actually lead you to conclusions that are somewhat artificial from uh, a comprehensive review of the documents. So that's my take on the matter. We, so we have a panel of experts on this coming up, coming up. Yeah. yes, yeah. Uh, which would, I, I mean, I, I don't know if you guys have, have thoughts on, I mean, I'm looking forward to that, to that panel just to, just to sort of understand better. I mean, because, you know, there are a bunch of different issues raised, as your question suggests. I mean, one is, and gets back to Jeremy's point about sort of a presumption of, of declassification, um, and certainly, you know, there, 
we're supposed to have declassification after 30 years, um, except in you know specific instances where there are specific specific markers that would leave something classified. Is it possible for technology to? Uh, I mean, it is possible for technology to ex to uh, assist in declassification, but there's still questions as to. You know, I mean, even something that's 98 or 99 percent effective, um, you don't really want the something to be declassified that shouldn't be declassified, and so you, presumably you're still going to need um, some kind of human involvement. But then also, once you have this volume, I mean, I, you know, mentioned sort of working through collections before. You know, as a scholar, when you're working through a collection, you're, you know, you're hopefully working through something that's a manageable collection. Right? I mean, with the volume um, data that you're talking about, uh, you know, you're not going to be able to read through every one of those million uh, pages. Um, and so you are going to have to be using some kind of technology to assist you in you know, the big data analysis that you would have uh, of the materials. But as you're saying, I mean, being trained to really think about how you I mean, searching for particular words gets you something, but if there are you know, things you're not thinking about, then those documents are going to slip through. So the kind of training that we're going to be needing to do for people is, is um, you know, really thinking about. Uh, I have a colleague, Joe Tarigian, who's, an, who's a remarkable scholar and, uh, he was here this fall. and also a remarkable teacher. Uh, and he teaches a course on the scholar as detective. Uh, and I think, you know, that's, that's an important thing to keep in mind, a scholar as detective. Can we I, got, can well, we got three minutes and two questions, but yes, yeah. you may add whatever you like. Let me add two quick points. One, I think digitization is really a powerful tool. Um, I know that especially in the last four or five years, it's been really important for graduate students, for myself and others, to be able to access information that's been digitized abroad and for people who are abroad and not able to come to the United States to be able to continue um, their work um, using American archival materials. So one, I think that that is the, there's a, a lot of sort of pro-democratic potential um, in the digitization of archival materials. But two, I do worry about this issue that you know, in a, a two billion email sort of cache. Um, that keyword searching enables people to look only for confirmatory evidence. Mm -hmm. And we spend so much time training yep. students to look not only for information that would confirm their hypotheses, but disconfirm. Um, and, and there's a potential really sort of almost algorithmic or search bias um, that I think could emerge. And we're just going to have to think, I think, as, as people who train scholars in research design and methodology, how do we teach them to counteract that with this new set of tools and the ways that we now interact with sources? Um, I think it's a really hard question, and I, I don't have a good answer except to really talk seriously about that in, in the training that we do. Sir, I think you get the last question. Thank you. Well, Cradian, can we get the other questions in, too? Let's just member of the panel. Public Interest Declassification Board, to answer your yep. question earlier about the oldest classified records in the federal government. Uh, I believe a few years ago the CIA released um, the oldest classified record, which was from World War I, it was on secret writing, it's on the NARA website. And that made the next oldest classified record World War II era stuff. So I don't think there's anything from the 1900s or before World War II. Thank you for answering that. I think you, sir, get the last question. <laughs> <laughs> get to Got the just microphone under the wire. and don't leave. <clears throat> My name is Dave Miller, and I'll I won't call myself a scholar, I'll just say independent researcher. And my question deals with records retention. Um, at least Vietnam era war records, I know how they cleaned and purified the collection before they preserved it for long period. And uh, that was intentional and to some degree understandable. Uh, now, with paper records, retention has to be a very big issue because you can't have an infinite warehouse for paper. With electronics, you can have an infinite warehouse. So is there any work going on on moving away from, from retention 
to electronic retention? Yes, I think we do. Our, our later panel will address that explicitly. I, I know the answer to that, and it's yes, that there is active digitization going on in the many millions of cubic feet in the National Archives for this very reason of not only having a paper copy, which is susceptible to risks in all, all kinds no, of ways. I'm, I'm talking about records which are electronic, ah. which have no permanent retention, which are now actually being made for permanent so you can go easily look at them. I see. I see. I think that's probably a good panel from our archivists, uh, a good right. question for our archivists who will know more than I, and I'm getting the same confirmation from the rest of our panelists. Uh, I think that brings us right to the end, 931. Uh, thank you so much. It was a marvelous panel. Thank you to our scholars. Can we please give them a round of applause?